Hello, I'm the doctor. Welcome to Dr. Geek. Today, we're discussing Series 10, Episode 11, World Enough and Time. Now, before I get started, I want to first apologize for how late this review is. I was out of the country for a wedding and have been completely swamped the last week, but I promised to get my reviews up immediately after the episodes air in the future, since that was my original intent for this channel. Of course, I had to pick one of the most exciting and talked about episodes in the entire series to miss, but that's just how it goes. Let's jump into it. We open on the TARDIS in the snow, and it almost looks like a Christmas episode. Interesting, considering what we know about the Christmas episode this year. And sure enough, the Doctor exits his TARDIS in a huff, and while seeming in distress, falls to his knees as regeneration begins to flow from his face and hands. The Doctor is regenerating, and as the camera pulls back from the opening credits, he lets out a heartbreaking, no! What we can only assume are the last words of the Twelfth Doctor. This was an insanely shocking way to begin the two-part finale. While we know that the Doctor will begin to regenerate at the end of Series 10, teasing us like this means that whatever happens will likely happen in the next two episodes. And again, it's just absolutely heartbreaking. After the opening titles, we've jumped back in time to a massive ship in space and the TARDIS has just landed in the control room. But when the doors open, it's Missy and not the Doctor who appears with her two companions Bill and Nardole, although she calls them Thing 1 and Thing 2. Referring to herself as Doctor Who, Missy explains that they picked up a distress call and were here to help. Michelle Gomez is having a ball with her character and she can really do no wrong as she bounces around the ship with her excited energy. She truly owns every scene that she's in. Suddenly, an alarm goes off and the doctor, who's monitoring them from the TARDIS, tells the three of them to get moving and Nardole to do something not irritating. Using some of the nearby computers, Nardole discovers that the ship they're on is 400 miles long and 100 miles wide. Big, even for a colony ship. And even more surprising is that it's currently plunging into a black hole. Or at least, it was, until someone noticed. Now, it is reverse thrusting away from the black hole at a very slow pace. However, not as slow as the doctor feels the three of them are working, as he describes watching them try and figure things out like watching plants grow. At this moment, a man appears on screen and demands to know who they are. Missy again introduces herself as Doctor Who and refers to Bill and Nardole as her expendables, exposition and comic relief. The man tells them to stay where they are, for their own safety, before disappearing from screen. Bill now asks Missy why she keeps calling herself Doctor Who, to which she replies that she's pretending to be him, which is the whole point of this ridiculous exercise. But the doctor tells her it's not an exercise, it's a test. However, Bill wants to know why she's saying Doctor Who and not the doctor, to which Missy says that she's streamlining since people always ask Doctor Who anyways after he introduces himself, so she's saving actual minutes, she says while doing a dab. Also, it's his real name, to which Bill and all of us at home scream, what? She says he picked it himself, but dropped the Who when he realized it was a bit too on the nose. The doctor insists that she's just teasing Bill, trying to get a reaction out of her, and brushes it off, but she can't help feeling that Missy may be telling the truth. Suddenly, the man from the screen storms into the room, pointing a gun, and Nardole happily exclaims that he's blue, which wasn't exactly clear from his appearance on the video screen. The blue man, named George, tells them that there are things coming from the bottom of the ship using the elevators that are in the room, and demands to know which of them is human, as they only come when they detect signs of human life. After Missy calls him a bitch for accusing her of being human, Bill finally confesses to being the human, and George points his gun at her, ready to kill her, as the doctor comes out of his TARDIS to join them. The doctor begs George not to shoot, giving alternatives like shielding Bill in the TARDIS. He says the speech that we've heard months ago in the trailer for Series 10, but as the elevator doors open, 
George's fears gets the better of him, and he shoots Bill in the chest, leaving a massive hole in her body. Honestly, it's pretty horrific, as Bill looks down to see her mortal wound. I was absolutely shocked in this moment. We rarely see Doctor Who get this gruesome, and then to have the added horror of seeing it happen to a companion, and a well-liked one at that, was quite unexpected. Hopefully, her character will make it through this. Now, for the second time in less than 10 minutes, we get another flashback to a moment before the adventure that we've just witnessed. The Doctor is discussing the possibility of testing Missy to see if she could be good, but Bill does not like this idea, calling Missy a murderer and correctly assuming that Missy is far too evil and unpredictable to ever be trusted. Bill doesn't understand why the Doctor is so set on trying to help Missy, and the Doctor confesses that it's because she's the only person in the universe who's remotely like him. They promised each other when they were children that they would see every star in the universe, but the Master has been too busy blowing them up. The Doctor explains to Bill that Missy used to be a man. The Doctor says he thinks he was a man back then too, but it's too far back to remember. Let me just say here that I really groaned at this line, as it's just another instance of Stephen Moffat trying to change the lore of the show without actually having to do any of it himself. I really can't stand it when he tries to make sense of Time Lord genders with this one-off side conversations where half of what's said sounds like a joke. He's really done a huge disservice to the show's history and all of the past showrunners by muddying the waters of so many things in an effort to modernize the show. But that's just my opinion. The Doctor and Bill end their conversation on a plea from Bill that the Doctor won't get her killed. He can't promise that, but he says he will try. We now cut back to Bill and her massive chest hole. The elevators have arrived and some creepy hospital patients come out to collect Bill. The doctor asks what they're doing and they tell him that she will be repaired before taking her into the elevators and returning to the other end of the ship. The doctor now demands some answers from Blue George and learns that the colony ship is brand new and was on its way to pick up its passengers when it got stuck near the black hole two days ago. He tells them that they had a skeleton crew of about 50 people but when a group went to the other side of the ship, they never returned. And now, there are thousands of life signs in the ship that seemingly appeared overnight. On the other end of the ship, Bill is waking up, and a surgeon working on her tells her that the full conversion wasn't necessary. Yet. She sits up and discovers a large console on her chest, where the hole was. She is now part machine. From another room, Bill hears someone repeating a word over and over and over again, just one word, pain. She gets up to go and investigate and finds a room full of the same eerie patients, but these are sitting motionless in chairs, with one hitting a button on his keypad, the button, apparently, for pain. Bill hears someone coming and quickly hides, before seeing a nurse enter the room and approach the man in pain. She does something to his equipment that stops the pain and leaves the room satisfied. But when Bill goes to inspect what she did, she finds that the volume button has just been turned down and the patient is still suffering immensely. However, Bill can't bear the sound and keeps the volume low. Another patient is in the same situation, only he is repeating the phrase, kill me. This episode is really doing more than any other story before it to show how truly horrific the situation is for these people. As Bill looks out the window at a desolate city, she is saved from an approaching patient by a wild-eyed man named Razor, who bizarrely asks her if she would like some tea. She asks him what they're doing to the patients, to which he mysteriously replies that they are curing them. After asking her if she would like the good tea or the bad tea, but admitting that there is little difference, Bill notices a TV screen showing an image of the TARDIS team in the console room, to which Razor tells her it's a live stream. Bill asks how it can be live if it's just a still image, but Razor explains to her that the ship they are in is experiencing extreme time dilation due to its proximity to the black hole. Because the ship is 400 miles long, for every second on the top floor, almost two days goes by on the bottom. For every hour, 20 years. In the two days since the ship has been on the black hole, 
1,000 years have gone by in its depths. Bill has already been there for many weeks, bordering on months, but she cannot leave the hospital without her new heart losing its power. So, she waits for the doctor as the years go by. On the top floor, the doctor has worked out the time dilation as well and tells George that the thousands of life signs that appeared overnight are the descendants of his crew. Generations have gone by on the bottom floor and the original crew is long dead. The doctor knows that every second counts, so he takes out Blue George with a little Venusian Aikido, a nod to the third doctor who is a regular user of the technique, and Nardole and Missy join him in the elevators as they make their way down. Back with Bill, ten years have gone by. Bill learned from Razor that all of the people in the ship are dying since the ship around them has become so old. Their air is engine fumes, and they are weak and sick. The patients are the solution for them to become stronger again and finally make their exodus from the city, climbing together to the top of the ship. On the screen, Bill sees the doctor getting into the elevator and she begs Razor to tell her where the elevators arrive. Under duress, he finally agrees to take her to them. That night, the two sneak into the operating theater to which Razor has a key and they make their way to the elevators. Surrounding them are half-converted Cybermen, which scare Bill when she first sees them. As they begin to inspect the patients, the surgeon enters from behind and tells Bill that her turn has come to be converted. Razor has betrayed her. Bill pleads with them to not turn her into one of the patients. She tells them that the patients are screaming in pain every second of their lives, but the surgeon reveals that they have a solution for that now. The ring that goes around the heads of the Cybermen don't stop the pain, but it stops them from caring about it. A truly chilling thought. At the elevators, the Doctor, Misty, and Nardole have finally arrived. The Doctor wants to know more about the ship, but when Nardole moves to the computers, the Doctor tells them to instead let Missy do it, as she's cleverer than him. Nardole says she's also more evil, to which Missy replies that it's basically the same thing. As the Doctor and Nardole go to investigate, Razor appears from around the corner and tells Missy that he has been waiting for her. As Missy searches through the computer, she discovers that the ship is not actually from Earth at all, but from a very similar planet, almost its twin. The name of the planet is finally revealed to be what we already knew, Mondas, the home of the Cybermen. Meanwhile, the Doctor and Nardole find the conversion theater. After looking around and finding mentions of an Operation Exodus, the Doctor notes something standing just outside the light, and as it steps forward, we get our first look in over 50 years of a classic villain. The Doctor exclaims almost with glee, a Mondasian Cyberman. Back with Missy, Razor continues to pester her, asking her if she remembers him, to which she tells him she's never been there before, but he tells her she has a long time ago. Razor makes fun of Missy for trying to impress the doctor and tells her the doctor will never forgive her after he finds out what she did to Bill. Missy is confused about this, but it soon becomes clear to her as Razor removes his disguise to reveal the master, John Sims' portrayal of the previous incarnation of Missy's character. Hello Missy, I'm the master. I'm very worried about my future. Give us a kiss. The doctor speaks with the Cyberman and asks it to search its databanks for the location of Bill Potts. The Cyberman answers, accessing Bill Potts, locating Bill Potts. I am Bill Potts. Bill, what have they done to you? asks the doctor. Operation Exodus, suggests Nardole. But Missy walks in and tells him that that's really the wrong name. It's not an exodus at all. It's more of a beginning. In fact, do you know what I'd call it? Says the master, also walking in. I'd call it a genesis. The genesis of the Cybermen. As the sound of drums plays in the background, Bill reaches out her arm and tells the doctor that she waited for him as a tear slides down her Cyberman face. So, overall, I really, really liked this episode. 
As a huge fan of Classic Who, I had been waiting for the return of the Mondasian Cybermen this whole series, and the wait was worth it, as they look great, and I can't wait to see more of them next week. I thought the premise of the black hole time dilation was really cool and interesting, and unlike anything we've seen in Doctor Who before. And the emotional bond that we've been creating with Bill over this entire series was really tested as we essentially watched her die in one of the most brutal ways we've ever seen. This entire episode was carried by great acting, as has been the case for the majority of the series. But Michelle Gomez once again earns the title of MVP for just an extraordinary performance. I say it every week, but she completely owns every single scene that she's in, and most scenes in this episode are really worth watching twice, once to follow who's speaking, and again to watch all of Missy's reactions. For as much as I rant against Stephen Moffat, and especially his alterations to the gender policies of Gallifrey, I have to admit that the casting of Missy has been one of the greatest things to happen to Doctor Who since its reboot. It will truly be a shame when she leaves the series. But that brings us to our MVP runner-up, John Sim. When it was first announced that John Sim was returning as the Master, I was insanely excited, but more so for the prospect of a multi-master story than for the specific return of John Sim. I have to admit that I was never really a fan of his zany interpretation of the Time Lord nemesis of the Doctor. Where the past incarnations were always cold, cruel, and calculating, John Sim played the Master as more of an insane clown, tormented by demons and constantly going off the deep end. I found him to be a bit too off the wall for the goatee-wearing, smooth-talking, devil-in-a-crisp suit from the classic era. All of that changed with this episode, as it seems John Sim is finally playing the Master properly. Not only does he look the part, with an amazingly dark costume and even the famous goatee, but his love of disguises and insanely detailed plans all made his return not just a return for John Sim, but for all of the things that made the original Master such a lovable villain. It's going to be really interesting to see the second part of this story and watch the two Masters interact with each other and push each other in different directions. It also came as a shock to me that John Sim was playing Razor. Maybe I'm just super gullible, but I really didn't see a hint of John in that character, and if it had turned out that that was a completely different person entirely, I would not have been surprised. The character of Razor was very funny and charismatic, which made the betrayal of Bill all the more hurtful after we had seen him become the only companion that she had for all of the years that she spent down there. This was an all-around fantastic performance by John, and it truly changed my opinion of him, not just as the master, but as an actor in general. Rounding out the episode are solid performances by all three of the TARDIS team, with Nardole funny as ever, and Bill really putting in another powerful emotional performance that's going to make her departure, if it does happen, even harder to deal with. This episode did a lot to confirm the rumor that Pearl Mackey will not be returning in series 11, as it's going to be pretty difficult to get her out of her current predicament. But this is Doctor Who, and nothing is impossible. As for what I didn't like, I have to admit that it was slightly disappointing to not get to see the planet Mondas. We have never gone there in the television series, except for a very brief glimpse of it in the 10th planet, which was the first appearance of the Cybermen. The concept of the colony ship around a black hole was very cool, but I can't help thinking that seeing Mondas would have also been pretty cool, and we could have used this concept for another story. Still, it's hard to be upset about getting a genesis of the Cybermen story, so I can't complain too much. My only other annoyance is the characterization of the Doctor. In all of the show's history, you can count on one hand how many true companions have died while in service to the Doctor. Even when they do, it's normally due to their own actions, either by sacrifice or arrogance that the Doctor can't foresee. This is because the Doctor takes care of his companions and doesn't put them in knowingly unnecessarily risky situations. Therefore, I found it very strange that he would trust his two best friends with someone he knows is unstable, a liar, 
and generally malevolently evil. Someone who vaporizes people for fun. No matter how much he loves Missy or thinks she wants to reform herself, I just can't believe he would trust her enough to risk the lives of his friends. And that's exactly what gets Bill killed. He should be better than that. So, World Enough in Time is an excellent first half of a two-part finale. The Cybermen look amazing and have their eerie, sing-songy voices from the 10th planet that made them so creepy to begin with. In fact, this version of the Cybermen voices has always been my absolute favorite. But, starting from their second appearance, the Cybermen switched to a voice emulator used for throat cancer patients and never again used their original sound. The regeneration that was teased at the beginning of the episode likely indicates that the Doctor will be fatally wounded by the end of next week, and I wouldn't be surprised if what we just saw ends up being the cliffhanger for the Christmas episode, given how snowy it was. It's going to be hard watching next week with that on our minds, but hopefully Stephen Moffat gives Capaldi a death worth remembering. He's already given Peter his favorite enemy, as anyone who's ever seen an interview with Peter Capaldi knows that he's been asking for the original Cybermen to appear since he first landed the role of the Doctor. For an excellent first half that makes me wish it was a Saturday already, I give World Enough in Time 9 patience out of 10. So that was my review of Series 10 Episode 11. Be sure to like and subscribe for reviews and Doctor Who news every week. On the side, you can find my review for Series 10, Episode 10, The Eaters of Light. So check that out if you haven't already. And soon to come, I'll be doing a Doctor Who discussion on the Mondasian Cybermen. So stay tuned for that. Thank you for being my companion on this journey today. I'm the Doctor. Bye for now.